Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to Dumb SEO Questions, episode 250. I never thought we'd reach 250. Um, each week we, we meet here to answer the questions asked on the SEO Questions community on Google Plus and also on the Facebook group Dumb SEO Questions. With us tonight we have um, some of the people who uh, um, got us to episode 250. Uh, we don't see them much these days. Uh, we see more of Tim Kappa than we want to, but um, um, anyway, <laughs> we miss you guys, and I'm so glad that you turned up. Um, Alistair Lattimore, uh, he, he looks after more uh, um, web screen real estate uh, than Rupert Murdoch. Uh, he works for the Expedia group of companies. I, I probably haven't described it well, and I don't know how to describe your job title, Alistair. I, I do SEO for Expedia. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Petrovic uh, is uh, Australia's leading internet publicist. He's CEO of the uh, Jean SEO. Um, uh, who uh, are based in Brisbane, uh, not far from me. And um, Dan Teese is uh, a PPC expert from the USA. David Rosam uh, is um, uh, a, a leading internet marketer from um, the south side of uh, the UK. Um, Masataki Wasa is webmaster of wasaweb.net. Um, Micah Fisher Kirshner is uh, um, senior uh, senior SEO manager or director of uh, I'm not sure either. Um, but yeah, at, uh, yeah. Zen, like, <laughs> he's also a regular on the SEO public speaking circuit. Says Meyer. Um, Sash is... How do we uh, jump to me? Uh, how? <laughs> I'm just going down the list, Sash. All oh, right, I'm seeing myself just, at the end. I'm just, sorry, I apologise. <laughs> just, yeah, just going down the field street. Um, Sash is, is a disaster recovery specialist. Um, he's currently based in Texas. Uh, Tim Kappa is CEO of OnlineOwnership.com. Uh, he is a conversion rate optimization specialist and um, I'm proud to call himself an SEO. And uh, William Rock um, from Kansas in the USA. William is also proud to call himself an SEO. Um, guys, um, uh, I, I, I wonder if I can ask... Uh, what it means to be an SEO. Um, I, I saw another spate of those SEO is dead posts the other day. Um, we're always going to be here, right? All right, I'll take it. By the it way, now. if you haven't been here before, just feel free to jump into any vacant spot. <laughs> right. Um, SEO is dead. There we go. We're done. Now, um, the thing is, if you're still around today, and if you if you're calling yourself an SEO, then then you're publicly calling yourself an SEO, then then you've probably done something right. Um, it's just that SEO is not what it was, say, ten years ago. It's not even what it was, say, five years ago when when you started these hangouts. Um, it's no longer the, the silver bullet, the be all and end all. It's one component in the toolbox of online promotion. I mean, unless you have a grounding in, in solid marketing principles and in, in consumer psychology and in a whole slew of other stuff like conversion optimization, for instance, which is still woefully underplayed by a lot of people, um, you know, you, you're just, you're not going to win the battle with SEO. So if you're an SEO now, you've obviously taken on board the rest of, of what you need. So, SEO is dead. Yeah, the old formulaic SEO, you know, keyword in bold three times, all that. That's all dead. Um, but as a discipline and as a job title, no, not if you're doing it right. That's my two cents. 
I think the other part of it as well is the um, Google continue to say that only, you know, in the grand scheme of things, only a relatively small portion of the total available clicks go out through ads. So while there's still vast volumes of phrases going out through organic or through other ad unit or other other units on the page that aren't pure ads, uh, I think you know there's still going to be a, a reason for the discipline to exist. Um, and at the end of the day, you know Google's still primarily uh, a search engine, I guess, to find stuff, and it's yeah. our jobs to help help businesses build websites that maximise their exposure and help customers find their sites. And I don't think that's going to change. Maybe the percentages of paid versus organic will, will continue to jostle over time, but um, I think there's still a, a long a long history of uh, SEO to come in the future to still be written. Yeah, I've been doing SEO since before we called it that. I mean, it's <laughs> there's there's me, there's always going to be a need for people to do the right things uh, with websites, and and the people that that own them are usually not going to have the slightest idea what that is, and they'll often do things that are harmful to them. So in terms of is, that, is it going to be a job? Yeah. I mean, the fact is I can get more profit out of search results by running PPC ads than I can by having number one organic listings. But, you know, that's just, you know, the, the nature of the way the search result is presented. But that doesn't mean people never click those darn things down there below the fold. Don't know what statistics you're looking at, but okay. <laughs> Math analytics. I mean, we've got number one organics, and we've got PPC ads that are that are bringing more money in. So that's what I'm talking about. I think it just goes back to the experience that uh, an SEO. If, if, like Sash said, if, they, if you have your name as rep, um, being said in the industry as an SEO, then that that's a good signal that you've obviously done something right. But going back to the historical pieces, most people coming into the industry now don't realize what happened in the past to understand why those things are happening in the future with algorithm penalties. So I think SEO in one form is definitely never dead. That's interesting you should mention that. I wonder if, if it matters to the young talent that's coming onto the scene if, if all this history we went through is seniors of the of the profession does it really matter to understand the evolution of google to be able to do your job properly what are the advantages of knowing the past in comparison to just knowing your job now as it is with the rules as they are now well yeah and especially with people that go out and read a whole bunch of articles from way back in the past that are not even correct and so they start believing those techniques are still live and therefore the newbies are getting back into the habit of actually harmful uh, tactics for companies. They don't even realize they're doing that. But it's something they read and they thought they trusted. It's not even just the newbies. I mean, there's, there's, um, there's a handful of very established people that are still, for some reason, um, following the old school ways, old school ways. And uh, yeah, it's. I mean, that the numbers are shrinking, but that they are still out there, even even now. I like what's happened with SEO. I think at least two things that I really enjoy seeing done well today in comparison to what we did in the past. And one is that the SEO consultant has really turned into a business consultant, a person that jumps into the business and understands the ins and outs, the intricacies. The connections of in, in the in the business world, the connections within the office, um, understands the roles of each staff member that plays in your role, from people who update the website, write the title tags, to uh, those who code or um, those who are in in PR and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, the other aspect, uh, and of course, strategically providing recommendations really highlighting isolating areas that really matter rather than just going through some arbitrary checklist. Um, the other aspect I really enjoy about SEO today is the, is the, the creative side of it. You know, the, the content is so competitive. You know, everyone's competing to get that best piece of content out there that the bar is really high for that 10x. And that's a good thing because the quality of content um, has been increasing as a result. 
um, in addition to all this other rubbish that's just noise. Um, and I've seen a couple of uh, SEO agencies evolving towards creative PR uh, and digital PR agencies, and I really like that. And I've been and I've been doing that myself. Um, and that's very enjoyable work seeing seeing a creative piece of content, a creative campaign being promoted in clever ways and achieving the results for client. And the most important thing is that these results have scope broader than just Google or search engines. The value of what we do today goes beyond the search okay. engine itself. The content that brings traffic, even if the Google didn't exist. And I, I really like that idea. Yeah, I have to say, I've done a couple of video publicity stunts that went so far beyond the scope of uh, of just search engine promotion that it, it was ridiculous. I mean, one one of them went <laughs> hideously viral. <clears throat> and that's that's very, very cool to see when you can actually see the results of your <laughs> sweat and blood, um, you know, rolling down rolling down the hill so to speak that's that's really cool who says you can't buy links anymore i see it <laughs> google <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> you're, not, you're not allowed to you can still go and buy some links oh of course oh, yeah. uh, obviously <laughs> it's not as effectively uh... <laughs> your money would be better spent driving traffic and getting natural links but Knock yourself out if you want to go PBNs or whatever. We had a question about that this week. Well, and go back into some of these site audits, like I'm doing for SEM Rush right now, and, and people are still buying links. And I think that's the big problem is the disconnect we were just talking about with people just coming into the industry, whereas we're kind of seasoned. We've seen the big hits from penalties throughout the years and know exactly what they did and when they actually happened. So going back into our forensics audit, you, we can see and know exactly when they you know, dropped and when they climbed. And, and with those links, their agencies are still buying these. Even internal um, marketing teams are still going out and pursuing links because it says it on the internet, we should actually, links are good, right? But they don't understand what kind of links are good. The, the whole link market reminds me of um, the gold fever. You know, the, the miners didn't make as much money as those selling the tools. And I think, sure. I think the real money used to be in selling links. Um, and before, before I started my agency, I made a ton of money um, through, uh, through link trade. That was the best. Um, now, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, uh, it's just easy money and I didn't put a gun to anyone's head. They just, it was in high demand um, and I was the, the tool seller. Anyway, uh, the situation's changed a lot since then. I don't, I don't know if any of the old link markets are uh, around or alive, um, but um, I would be really surprised to see the classic public, public blog networks or link networks. They call themselves private, but I reckon P stands for public because as soon as it's available for sale, it's a public network, not a private network. It I doesn't work if network. the search engine can't find the links, and once they can, it's it's trivial to map it out. It's just a matter <laughs> of deciding to do it. <laughs> yeah. you, see, you see some cases where it, where it works, but the risk is so high that it's just reckless to go and, and do it. Um, but when it, when it flies under the radar for too long, you just like it pisses you off because like, how are these guys getting away with it? Um, the thing is, yep. the thing is, the, one of the one of the clever SEO tactics is that um, people would create the worst backlink profile to fool their competitors and just just bloody disavow everything. So disavow files not reflected in the Moz and Ahrefs and all the other tools. So they're like, oh, they got all these links. It's working for them. So you copy their link profile, get yourself penalized. Um, so that's a bit devious. Um, but I, like, I really put a question on whether those really easy to get links really do anything anymore. Actually, what would be super devious if they uh, um, owned the sites that all those dodgy links were on, and so that their competitors could buy the buy the links from them to copy their link profile. I like it. Or is somebody here already doing that? No. 
tell me something. <laughs> Do you think it was uh, a smart move on Moz's part to rebrand from SEO Moz to Moz? I think the fact that they went back to doing just SEO again kind of suggests maybe not. I would say that's more of a, a reflection that it's probably harder for them to break away from their uh, legacy brand. Right. Like, you, you can't come up and just decide tomorrow that you want to go and change, you know, five or ten or years worth of historic brand association just because you've removed the word SEO out of a brand or like if tomorrow Coca-Cola decided that they wanted to get into food, right, it, it will be notoriously difficult for Coke to convince everyone that they're a premium food like a pie manufacturer when they've been making um, fizzy <laughs> drinks for two decades. Right, and it, it would take like long-term committed effort to re-educate the world that Coca-Cola also means great meat pies. It also means great fizzy drinks, you know. And if they did it on a whim, um, they might struggle with it. There was, I think, a few years ago, um, the whole branding stampede. Um, Majestic did the same thing going from Majestic SEO to Majestic. And there just seems to have been a um, a trend to just turn around and go for the clean brand name. And I don't think it worked as anticipated. And I think it's it's basically for, for many of the reasons Alice has just outlined. But Mars certainly isn't alone in this. Um, there's there's a handful of, uh, of instances. Well, Moz wasn't even really committed to repositioning. I mean, you know, they had this new tool. They thought they were going to, it was going to take off. It didn't. They failed to articulate any value in Moz analytics whatsoever. Not that it wasn't valuable. They just didn't bother to tell anybody why they should care about it. And it's, you know, repositioning ain't no joke. I mean, <laughs> you got to be committed and, 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 and you got to really be prepared to burn bridges. And, you know, they wanted to have, you know, they wanted to have their cake and sell their fizzy Coke. And it don't work like that. But no, that, well, first of all, and second of all, you've you've just said you didn't bother to tell anyone. That's that's really the thing. That's what we're coming back down to. This is this there's there seems to be this unholy trinity in internet promotion because your SEOs, by and large, um, you know, or some of the operators are not very technical. Market marketers definitely aren't technical. Um, you know, and developers don't tend to have any kind of clue about uh, user experience or best practices. So you have you have these almost mutually exclusive skill sets, and this is where now emerges the, the the kind of the new professional, which is what I said earlier. Somebody with a solid of understanding of everything, and there's you know that's that to me is the way forward. Um, if I if I had a dollar for every developer I've had to beat into shape just about basic basic practices it's actually ridiculous yeah and in addition to that you know you're you're doing a rebound you need to have the the, the cash the investment to be able to handle it for the long term and you know the difficulty for for a smaller size company of like Moz is I don't think you know they didn't they didn't have it uh, at least not for the long term and I think that makes it makes a tough call like are you going to be pushing for more money and able to handle it or do you cut what you are potentially at the, at least I think would be one way to put it is like cutting the losses um, I mean I think I think just uh, the amount of investment that they would have to to do is go above and beyond the investment already made in their SEO side in order to showcase that the value they were providing for their other tool sets um, was just going to be too high. Uh, so sometimes, I mean, a lot of times, sometimes just those brand remarketings just don't work. Um, it's not the right time or it's not the right amount of investment for it. Um, but Companies, yeah, you can't can't go along in life without taking some type of risk. Um, so I do give them credit for at least trying, but 
uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think the effort was was either was the right uh, or was the right amount for what they needed to do. We dropped SEO from our name, changed to the Marketers Brain Trust instead of the SEO Brain Trust three, uh, four years ago. But we also did that in a room at our event with two thirds of our clients present after having conversations with them for two days about what we were thinking about doing. <laughs> we didn't, didn't pull the trigger and, 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 uh, uh, until we were, were certain that our clients liked it. Because the, the weirdest thing is you can change your name and your clients get mad at you. You, you could be doing the same thing and they can be mad at you. It's people get weirdly attached to brands for no good reason. Yeah, this reminds me, I think I've spoken about this before. Um, I suffered from brand inertia symptom um, in the past. And as part of our effort to remove SEO from the whole thing, um, I just did the crazy thing and removed SEO from our title tag on the homepage. I mean, who does that? Um, but I did. We just left Dijon. There was no Dijon SEO anymore. So Google put it back for us in the search results. They rewrote our, your, uh, the, the title and put it back in. So they didn't help. Um, but what, what I, uh, so it gave me an article so from my blog anyway. Um, so, but on the other side, we successfully managed to rebrand the name so people wouldn't call us uh, Dijon SEO, but they didn't call us Dijon Marketing either. Just dropped everything and they just call us Dijon. Still, we are Dijon. However, uh, the name changed. Like Moz is now Moz instead of SEO Moz. But what we do hasn't changed in people's minds. A lot of people still think that we our main strength is link building. That's something that we approach the market with, but we've built such a momentum and such reputation on that, that that we're still known and we still get calls for link building services, although we, we've completely played it down. So it's a very big challenge. And I wonder if I, if I did the same thing that um, you did, um, uh, Dan, and, and we, you know, gathered a lot of people, did a PR campaign and um, just updated everyone. I wonder if it would work and do the trick or we'd still have same problem regardless uh, and it's it you, you got to have conversations I mean you got to tell your clients what you're thinking about doing why you're thinking about doing it if you just spring stuff on people any change it just there's a negative reaction to it you know I mean it Moz clearly didn't give up on SEO when they took SEO out of the name right I mean they still think domain authority is a thing right but <laughs> but uh, but uh, but what they what they did was just you know they just market like you know ooh, you know and and uh, I mean I knew about it ahead of time and and there were other people but it was like you know don't tell anybody okay I'll, <laughs> I'll let you do that <laughs> but you know it's it's it, it's just it's just nuts to think that you, that that you know it's go back and read the Clue Train manifesto I mean markets are conversations and you have the opportunity now especially with the internet even with a global client base to have that conversation. I think the other part of it as well is like you need to look about the conversation piece is it's about educating people, right? And so if you want to drop SEO out of a name, that's fine. Do that. But if you at the same time also want to change people's perception of what you do, then you, there has to be a real conversation about this and you need to start. Don't just tell them that you do it. Demonstrate that you do it. So, you know, like if Moz wants to go into new verticals, like heavily go into SEM related stuff as an example, well then, you know, it'd be like build out the tools, drop SEO from the name, build out the tools, build out a whole pile of case studies, show the market how they're amazing at doing the next thing, you know, and then over time people will begin to recognize them as not doing just SEO, that they're a marketing tool agency not just an SEO tool agency, but but simply dropping it without all of this continued investment and continued discussion, um, you know, it'll be tough, or just or, or maybe just really slow um, to happen, and it, maybe it doesn't happen at the pace that they need it to happen, uh, or for any business. I shouldn't say mods. This is relevant for any other business, I guess. It's all gone quiet.
Yep. Just moment of well, silence for the dead horse. <laughs> All right. Um, let me ask you another question. Um, with the uh, continual rise of um, Bing and um, Microsoft actually paying people to use it, at what point um, should SEOs be talking about Bing SEO instead of Google SEO? I think that's or is good. that a bad question? No, I think it's a great question. I think Bing gets forgotten about quite a bit because you know it's just Bing, it's Microsoft. But <laughs> and it's a different notion. I mean, the ad system on on Bing. So Bing ads is one of the cheapest ways to go versus AdWords. So for clicks, for one reason, my conversions are so much. Less expensive on that side of the platform, but most SEOs have kind of just went straight to just Google. They're not actually focused on the Bing, the Zan, all different out there in their different countries. So, I think. Yeah, I think. Oh, oh no! I that. Not, oh, sorry. No, no, go for it. Sorry. Let me finish that last piece. But people are also yeah. missing out on Webmaster. So the Google, the Bing Webmaster tools also gives you a totally different insight than what you do in. in Search console, so that's all I was going to say. Like, <laughs> take um, it. Yeah, I, I think part of it. There was a great uh, article making this point that my, that Microsoft, in this case, Bing, shot itself in the foot by basically comparing itself so heavily to Google that everybody was like, "Okay, so how are you different?" Um, so if we just optimize for Google, everything works for Bing. Okay. And just shrug, and you ignore it ever since. Um, the the Bing went so hard on trying to copy the concept of what Google had that people just associated it as, as a search engine that does the same thing. And there's no reason then to study Bing in in a lot of ways and learn for at least a few of the areas in which there is some differences because you say, well. 90 plus percent, let's just say, is, is roughly the same thing. And I oh. think that, yeah. Several years ago, back in the day, a buddy of mine, his job at Bing was to keep track of how close their search results were to Google because that was their quality metric. You look at their, their paid search solution. It, it, it is such a knockoff of AdWords that you can literally import almost every campaign that you have without anything changing. Even the crazy crap that we do with shopping campaigns on Google works exactly the same on Bing, and we just do a straight import. Okay, so they 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 have not tried to differentiate themselves because they've tried to be identical. It's not just a matter of they haven't you know gotten the right message out. They're different. They're trying to be the same. It's actually quite interesting. I'd never I'd never really rationalized it this way before. But Bing is actually the Taco Bell of the search world. You know. Wherever McDonald's or, puts a restaurant, let's do it too. Wherever <laughs> them existing ever, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people think that um, Google needs competition, real, real competition, not like niche search engines like Wolfram Alpha and all the weird ones. Um, but in fact, I think Google is quite threatened by um, other types of search. You I know, think the only existential threat to Facebook. Google is ad networks like Facebook. I mean, whether they do search or not, right. Google sells advertising and Facebook has a way anytime they want to with all these open graph tags to, to deploy something that kicks double clicks butt on targeting all across the web. They just haven't done it yet. Because people don't go to Google to buy, to buy a, um, a used uh, bicycle. They go to Facebook Marketplace and find it there and they do their searches there. But Facebook itself is threatened by marketplaces which are a lot more integrated, a lot more um, uh, broad, and uh, that's what's happened in China. Has anyone actually had a, a look at that documentary that goes over how you can use, uh, is it WeChat that's dominating there? Uh, phones yeah. have replaced cash over there. It's crazy in almost no time at all. Yeah, like you. You, you organize your dog grooming from it, you walk into a restaurant, you eat, you exit, there's no exchange of money, it's already happened. You're booking, the, like pretty much your whole life is in the app. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the real threats um, to Google. And that's their real competition. Um, what might happen is we actually might see Google competing a lot more within their own results. 
with um, information providers like you know flights and um, so everyone who's in, in information business is at a risk now. Yeah, I, I think the, the long, I think one of the largest uh, long-term or existential threats is becoming is being disintermediated. Where, uh, for example, if you're using an iPhone, you don't know that the search engine. If you're talking to Siri, that's Bing that's giving you any result. It's just completely like it's a search result. Like it, they, they're just giving you the information back. They're not giving you a, a first result of, from like pulled from Yelp or from somewhere. It's actually pulling from Bing, and most people don't recognize or know that. Um, and so that that type of information that's being pushed back to you is stripping out because of the platform itself owning how that information gets to be displayed. And I think that's probably as well a large threat to Google's business, where it, it, they can be swapped out with anybody at any any point, and everybody's like, eh, seems the same. No more brand name, no more influence. That's a large. That that's a long. That's a real threat to kind of uh, what they're able to do if they are basically just another random. Uh, what's the word? A, a a dumb pipe. Yeah, but I think also you got you got Google that has everything. They've got your G, your email, your messaging. Your social with Google Plus. They've got your business map location that controls everything, and then you've got Google Analytics, your AdWords, all tied into one dashboard. Your YouTube, the list goes on, and all one login, just like Microsoft Bing has been able to do. To assume, um, but the, having a, having everything, even a payment thing that's kind of missing. I think Google Wallet was there for a little while with the card, and that that's went away. Android Pay is, is one of the ones that's there too. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, there, there's a lot of the. It's interesting in in a lot of ways because it's. Uh, I was just talking this with a friend the other day where, the sake of ease and the ability to do a lot of this stuff actually requires, uh, the negatives of a monopoly in order to have everything interconnected. At the same time, it's like well, we also don't want necessarily from competitive enough standpoint from creating a better market for economics for for new competition and new ideas you don't necessarily want it but if you want everything connected almost need these massive monopolistic structures in order to be able to have it across because nobody today at least has built something in a pure like open source structure where it, it doesn't matter who owns what it's just you want to use uh, Dropbox for your for your network, but you want to use Google Account for this to uh, Cortana as your search engine. And like, good luck. Like, I can't get any of that like generally connected across different devices. Uh, on top of that, so that's probably the one thing it would be nice to have right, personally. But for right now, if you want all that nice fluid structure, you have to you one 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 top name. That's all you get. Yeah, until the monetary system actually allows for interoperability uh, to a greater degree with blockchain or something like that, it kind of it kind of is. I mean, it, and and in the U.S., we really have you know multiple solutions that are all slowly growing, but uh, none of them can take over because none of them can do everything and be everywhere. You switched outside now, huh? Nice view. Had to. It's getting too hot in there. Oh dear, I I, I haven't got a clue. But Dan, would you like to take uh, take over as MC and think of a question for me? Which Dan? Yeah, the, 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 that one. <laughs> <laughs> we never answers first. <laughs> What's the um, uh, is this uh, question there uh, cut off? Uh, yeah, I was I was going to leave those um, for, for, for you for 
I was going to leave those uh, for you guys. We have eight questions in our normal uh, uh, show, but I, I thought since you guys were kind enough to come along, I wouldn't put you through the misery of it. I reckon we should uh, give it a shot with at least a few. Yeah, let's go. All for right. It. All right. Um, we'll look at our first question. Uh, oh, dear, you're going to love this. Um, and it's from Tyler William. Uh, it's titled, One of Our Sites is Struggling with Page Load Time. Uh, Tyler said, hey, guys, that one of our sites is struggling with page load time because the home page is a 14 megabyte behemoth. We've done all the basic things, compress cache, better hosting, etc. Um, but it's no match for 33 plugins and mountains of content. The content has, the, the client has no uh, interest in trimming the fat. I've seen sites like Web Speedmaster promising two second load times. Uh, thoughts on how legit companies like these could be. Uh, if you know of a quality site speed specialist, I'd appreciate contact info. I can take a crack at this because it's about 10 seconds worth of answer. Uh, no, no site speed website is going to deliver a 14 meg page fast. When they talk about a two second load time, they're talking about optimizing an already reasonably quick site uh, that's not horrible and not 14 meg. Um, you just can't transfer 14 meg over the wire fast. You, you just can't do it. So it doesn't take a specialist to say get rid of all that crap. That's right. It's it's going to be crap regardless. So the only way this client is going to improve their site load time is by cutting the fat. They mightn't like it, but that's the only path forward. Particularly if they've already done the compression, um, and it's still 14 meg uh, with gzip running. Well, there's nothing they can do. So any amp specialists in this group? Well, the other thing uh, you would probably want to consider is mobile first indexing. I mean, uh, when you're compressing a 14 meg file, I mean, that's not going to, like he, um, Alistair said, it's not going to come over the wire very fast, especially if the device is primarily, or the, the industry is primarily mobile traffic. You know, you've got to be able to compress. They're going to bounce every single time. You might even be looking at your Google Analytics ranking, you know, traffic right now, and see your average time on site is near to nothing because of that. And that could be affecting rankings as well. So I would probably look at if it's that big, you've got more than just images, and JavaScript, and plugins. I'd go back through. Even the client's not wanting to go through. It's still kind of give them a suggestion of possibly those plugins that are already firing off too heavy. And there's, there's a lot of articles out there showcasing, especially even from like Amazon, of like how much of a conversion benefit you get out of every, what is it, half second or something. Um, so I, mean, I think even just relatively recently, Google put up their own version of that same type of deal to say, well, totally. here, your second, you get this much extra traffic and theory conversions. Um, that should be the really the overriding philosophy here beyond just the, the load time, just showcasing like, here's the amount of people you're actually losing by doing this. Um, one of the things I'd love to do is then as well showcase the competitors. You can actually take a nice little film strip, highlight how long it takes at each, in this case, probably every second, <laughs> how long it takes for your page load against every single competitor is probably only going like, you know, a second or less and just be like, yeah, you're, you're over here. Everybody else has done like that. And, and I think sometimes uh, people or at least higher ups have a much stronger reaction when you can showcase how everybody else is beating you. And then that, that laying out kind of essentially the, the case, because in the end, it's not saying what your job now isn't what the right thing to do is, but the showcase, and provide the, the facts behind why this needs to be done and how it's being done by everybody else. Um, because fine tuning from here is, is just, it's not gonna, not gonna cut it. You need to wholesale just strip, strip down and slim it, up, slim it, slim it out. No, I must one say, I mean, over the last, oops, sorry. I was gonna say one Go thing on. that Dan mentioned before, he asked about what could you do with AMP? Um, so let's assume for a second that you install the AMP plugin for WordPress 
and you adjust the theme, um, the plugins will still be enabled. So depending on how the plugins are configured, you could still deliver out a gigantic AMP compatible page, and it could still be slow. It'd be AMP compliant, but it could still be 14 meg of HTML. On the, on the flip side, if the guy installs the AMP plugin for WordPress and turns off 50% of the really, really horrid plugins that are generating out the, the gigantic payload of his page, then you know he could get a, a relatively nice, fast site. So going, going back to what Michael was saying just a second ago, I mean, over the last few months, I've used mobile first, Google's mobile first test tool um, to do side-by-side -side comparisons of customers versus their competitors, and nothing scares them more. I mean, Mike is absolutely 100% right. Nothing scares them more than to see the performance differences side-by-side. -side. It's like, oh, my God, I didn't realize it was that bad. It would be interesting if you set up uh, an experiment um, and A-B test the two versions. One, remove all the heavy imagery. I know it's been said that it's optimized, but um, we, you know we haven't seen this page. If we had the URL, to take a look at, sometimes people say, we've compressed the images. Mm -hmm. They've compressed the image in Photoshop, perhaps, and then it's like uh, 20,000 pixels wide and then just shrunk down in HTML instead of using correct. You know, there's like any number of things could be still wrong with it. I just I just find it really difficult to believe that a page of that size cannot be um, reduced uh, further using common sense. Um, so I think one motivation for the client, in addition to understanding the benefits of uh, gaining those extra seconds and gaining uh, losing those customers would be just proposal. Same as if, it, if you were doing uh, A-B testing. Show them a little, tiny little lean page that's pretend it's about conversions. Uh, create a call to action element, a little bit of content uh, that's useful for, for the users and remove everything else, plugins and the lot. Um, and Show it, show it in action. When they realize how many more conversions they're getting, um, then you have a really strong case. And if if the lean and quick loading page is losing, then keep the old fat page and let it load for a long time, if that's the actual outcome of the experiment. We, we probably know that the case will be in favor of a small page, but you never know. That's when you need to test things. Thank you, Dan. All right. So, well, dare, dare I ask, would you like to answer another? Let's do it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Next one, um, I'll just tweet that. Next one is titled, What is the best long tail keyword tool? Uh, Neil Cheeseman asks, uh, uh, or the best way to find long tail keywords and competition is there a free way did somebody just mention lsi down there <laughs> you know, I, I use primarily sem rush with the keyword magic tool because it breaks it down pretty easy but it's not free so i have a pretty good one i wrote an article about that and um, instead of using uh, acronyms, and I think I gave it um, my own name, I called it New Tail instead of Long Tail. And what I tried to do is describe the keywords that are not just Long Tail, very long keywords, but the keywords you haven't considered at all. Um, and this happens when you simply ask people. So how I did it, I did it in using Google surveys. And I asked people, I would show them a picture of the product. And I said, what would you type in Google to find this? Um, it, could be an, it doesn't have to be an image. It could be a question. Let's say you're in this situation. What service would you seek if you need to solve this problem? The amount of new keywords and new phrases and ways of hitting the product in a very roundabout, unusual way is just tremendous. 
So for like 10 bucks, you can survey 100 people. I think that's enough to get some ideas going. For 100 bucks, if you're a bit more serious, um, you get 1,000 uh, thousand answers using Google surveys. If you have substantial traffic on your own site, you can do it for free using WordPress plugins or other plugins that collect custom information. You can survey people on your own site. Or you can get out on the street and just do it old school way. Do not recommend, but it, it is possible. So um, just asking people what they would do and what they would type in is a great way to find really interesting um, long tail keywords and discover things you've never people would type in to look for you. Yeah, and as an addendum to that, um, particularly since I work in Zunda, uh, your customer service address, they're going to have a, all that information uh, in their heads from talking to a lot of different customers. Ask them. Survey them. Go and work with them to uh, pull in the ticket data and just run an analysis off of how people are talking inside of your, your tickets, your, your call center, uh, voice histories. You're, you'll get a lot of the data right there for what people are actually talking about. If you can't pull from from anywhere else, that is a great area to to really understand how people are thinking about and talking about your product. Yeah, I was going um, to to what I was going to say. Um, my very first thing when taking on a new client is spreadsheet gets created. All the customer and, and customer service reps basically note down exactly what was asked. And that's and that's the very from day one, and uh, it's a live doc, and you can be accessed and viewed at any any point. Yes, you do get the repetitive ones, and you do get ones which are, but you know, out of every ten, you get a little gem, and and you know, it just continues from day one, and it, it's a fantastic source direct from your customers who are phoning you using natural language. Uh, in what they in what they have or, or you know or what they can't find or what they want to know about a product or service. Yeah, the other thing I would probably suggest is actually the Q and A from your phone systems. What are people calling in about the most? Can you also not only go after the long tail keywords, but also utilize something that you can help create on your website that's helpful for re re reducing those call logs and getting them to a higher level conversion level when they call you. you know, so they've already been educated based off your product inside your Q&A. Cool. Dare I ask another question? Uh, yeah, Dan will say yes, he has to run. Look, thank you, Dan. Thanks for, for coming along. I, I know you've got uh, something to do early in the morning, and I appreciate uh, you were sparing the time to share with us. Uh, um, thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you back here in five years' time uh, for episode <laughs> 500. I look forward to it. See you later, Take guys. It, Dan. Take it easy. All right. And Alistair, thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, I, I see that um, you, you're. Um, um, the, the last uh, episode, the episode 200, we wanted you to come and, and you were flying uh, to um, uh, the USA. And uh, somebody told me that um, uh, Matt Storms uh, is flying from the USA to Sydney. Yep, regularly. Anyway, yeah. Well, he's I, your, you know, he's I, your I, counterpart I said, trip advisor, actually. Yeah, well, well, I, I said this. Uh, I said in the chat, Sash, uh, you weren't here, but uh, I said in the Sash, uh, I said in the chat that it's not fair. I mean, Australia should get ten mat storms if we're sending Alistair over there. <laughs> Does Australia? No, no, no. I'm not saying it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Alistair, thank you very, very much. Um, and You're welcome. Yes, in. in uh, in five years' time, we'd like to see you back for our 250th. So we have our 500. <laughs> see you later. <laughs> see you guys. See you, All right. Um, well, that's really good. I, I love um, uh, catching up with Dan and uh, Al Alistair, and uh, really glad uh, that we did. Actually, Dan and Dan? Alistair are two two of the the finest in the profession. There's no question about it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. What did you think of Dan Tees? You lost swords a couple of times, says. Um. I don't know. He's just a, a long-term professional. He has his own opinions, and that's cool. I mean, it's not a problem. SEO is ninety percent opinion and ten percent fact. So you know, it's not unusual to find somebody that has a different view. Um, okay. You know, for for myself, I would say, okay. You know, you turn around and you say, okay, I'll generate more revenue with PPC, but what's it costing you? Um, I've seen that. I've seen that really escalate. So, but I mean, that's that's his bag. That's not mine. So I can't really gauge it. Yeah. What's our All next right. uh, question? Let, let, let me tweet this one. And oh no, I just did that. So let okay. me. How about we get Rob and Edwin and, and everybody else in here now that there's some space? I think Rob room. is. Uh, um, Rob is uh, over uh, at, in Italy at the moment. Uh, I, I didn't think he was going to be able to come, but I sent him an invite anyway. Uh, I didn't realise we would fill. Um, um, otherwise, I would have um, uh, opened up a 15-person hangout. Um, anyway. Um, um, yeah, Masataki's already told them that there, there's someone uh, that there's space for someone. Oh, where is Masataki? Oh, there you are. Okay. All right. Um, here's a question I don't think we can answer. Uh, Malika Juna S uh, asked a question saying, "Hello, community. Uh, can you give me input on the below query? I want to do a, mo a mobile app digital analysis." So can you help me uh, on how to do a mobile app analysis? What are the parameters we need to consider? How can we check? Is there any online tool? Anyone help Malika Tuna S? Um, no, we're looking at it's, it's yeah, outside yeah. our scope, really, is it? Yeah. yeah Probably App Any, if they're looking for some type of analytics and reporting. Um, I think App Any is one of the common ones that you'll find uh, most of those in the app side uh, leverage. Um, it also depends on kind of what kind of analysis you're trying to do with that. But yeah, uh, that, that's probably going to be the biggest one I think I can think of. Okay. Uh, and as an FYI for that oh. industry, that's usually under um, App Store op optimization or ASO. So if, if the person's looking to get more information in, in that marketing channel, that's usually what it's called. So you might be able to find more information from uh, those experts uh, if you know kind of the right terminology there. Thank you, Micah. All right, let's, uh, let's go on. Um, Aubrey Thompson. Um, my bosses think adding a bunch of content alone will improve our rankings. Uh, Aubrey Thompson said, I second guess myself a lot, and so I want you guys to weigh in before I take this to my bosses. I've posted in here a few times, I work on a giant e-commerce site selling seasonal items. Ring a bell, Micah? Um, I have the site running in Streaming Frog right now, and although it's only halfway through, here's what it found so far. Duplicate title tag 704, duplicate H1's 1556, duplicate H2's 42, oh, I can't keep up with that. My bosses think adding a bunch of content alone will improve our rankings, but I disagree and I think we need to address everything. Again, this is only 55% of the sites. These numbers rise with every minute. Adding content without addressing this won't be very effective, right? Well, actually, no, just add more content. I mean, look, you know, if you add another 7,000 pages, you're going to rank for something, right? I mean, you have to. It's maths. No, ignore me. Seriously. Um, <clears throat> what, what do your bosses actually... Um, what do they envision with this new content? What What is it? Yeah, what does it do? What purpose does it serve? 
because just throwing throwing targetless and unfocused content just so you're going to hopefully rank for something you know throw enough spaghetti at the wall and something's going to stick um that that that's totally we're not doing that you can't do that um <clears throat> by the same token i would say yes absolutely address your issues first um you know but ask ask your bosses the question how how are they seeing this you know, it's very easy to say, yeah, we've got to add more content, but what is it? And I've, I've, I go through this on a regular basis. Well, what do you do? You know, how does this serve your target audience? How does this help your site? How does it um, improve the visitor experience? You know, and it's like if you go, okay, well, actually, you know, we're going to add some how-tos, some some maintenance manuals, some, some God knows what, then that's great. But on an e-commerce site, and I mean, bearing in mind, I, I don't know your product. Um, that's probably not so easy, especially if, as you said, you know, you, let's say you're selling Christmas trees. You know, how to put up a Christmas tree? Mm, how about the Christmas tree maintenance? Yeah, dust it once in a while. Um, it depends. Not every type of content serves every type of site and purpose. So unless you and or your bosses have a very clear idea what could be done um then saying we need to add more content is hollow and pointless and you can tell them i said that i'll go along with that um I, i've got uh, um something i've been working on quite recently where um the client has been putting in uh, a whole pile of uh, uh, of blog content, uh, and I've been working on the uh, on the standing content. It's a it's a it's a uh, a service industry, so it does have a load of uh, e-commerce pages. But um, the um, the blog content is d done without any thought of what benefit <laughs> it will have to the site. It's there's something going on and that might be interesting for our readers let's write it not only is it written in a vacuum but it's written not very well shall we say tell me so about it. i've got people like that <laughs> it's bad and quality content bad um so yeah so you you said what what i a particular drum i bang all the time which is tell me about it what what do you mean by content you know just saying put some more content in you know what's it going to be uh, a, a load of end of the pier jokes if you're a, a if you're on a, 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 a electronics e-commerce site well it's content isn't it but you know it's 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 got to have a very clear uh, a very clear uh, view for how it's going to come together, what it's going to do, um, why it's being created, who is going to create it, who is it going to be aimed at? You know, all of those, all of those content strategic questions that we should ask, but so often it's not asked. No, most of the time it's it's not asked, and I mean you you touched on it yourself with the not very well written. And this is something I, I I encountered a circular writing so often. It's like we only sell the best blue widget. So if you find a blue widget on our site, because then you can be sure that it's the best blue widget. Because well, if it wasn't, then we wouldn't be selling it because we only sell the best blue widgets. It's like <laughs> leave it alone. Oh, don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I you know it's some great answers um, too on the um, uh, Damasier questions community on on, on uh, Facebook. Um, great, some great answers. Not, uh, not wishing to take anything away from the already great answers, um, just uh, elicited here. All right, let's, um, Aubrey, I hope um, you find all of that useful and uh, let's move on to the next. Oh, God. Blake Alot said, how 
to do guest posting. Two questions. One, when reaching out for guest posts, do you already have the content written? Or do you email a blog asking if they accept guest posts and then write the content? Um, two, if you write the content out first, do you send the same content to a variety of blogs and give the content to the first one that responds? Hopefully that made sense. I just want to get a feel for how some of you reach out for guest posting. You're trying to guest post for links, judging by those questions. Don't do it. I don't, I don't guest post. I think Matt Cutts famously said, and I don't often quote Matt Cutts, but I, I think in this case, uh, it's probably the only thing he got right. Um, he said, um, stick a fork in it, it's done. <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, I don't do guest posts either. Just to add something a bit a bit late to this. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a load of work to be stamped on by by Google, perhaps. And it's a very yes. scattered kind of approach. I see God has just joined us. Hello, God. Looks like you're in Italy. Close in the Vatican. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, look, for, for Blake Aylott's benefit, um, the, the question you should ask yourself, if you're, if you're writing great content that other people would publish on their site, why let them publish it on their site? Why not publish it on your site? Um, the only thing... Um, that you, you would get from a guest post uh, is uh, the odd link, and Google's a wake up uh, to that. Um, there, there are quality uh, um, updates and so on, which certainly take care care of um, you know the sneaky link uh, inside a uh, well written article um, with perfect anchor text. Um, and if the anchor text is not perfect, why would you want it anyway? Um, it, it, it's just far smarter to write your own content and then go buy a link or, or get a link. Ring, 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 ring a friend. Ring Sash Meyer, he'll give you a link. Um, all right. Um, <laughs> when we're doing a quick there and we'll yeah. move on. One other thing. Oh, sorry, go ahead, William. Yeah, one other thing I want to add to that is when you're, you know, when we're doing, at least for me, I'm going through and doing. Is looking at penalty recovery. Now, those are the first things I start to go through and start marking as trying to get rid of. So, all right, let's um, move on. Tim Cap is off the air a bit tonight. Yeah, he's more longly, much louder than this. <laughs> Ryan Van Brunschot uh, asks a question uh, titled uh, Advice uh, on Getting Good at Backlinks. He said, I don't want to use a PBN, uh, a private blog network, as it is forbidden by Google. Um, Dan Tees, on uh, who, who was with us just a few moments ago and has just left, um, he said, uh, advice to get good backlinks. One, create something that people would want to link to and share. Two, drive traffic to it. Three, repeat. That's rather general rote advice, though, isn't it? <clears throat> How do you do it? Well, it depends on the site, doesn't it? Um, exactly. what, what, what the use of the site? I mean, what's the intent of the site? Um, it is possible to build on some some sites um, if 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 they're doing a certain thing in a certain way. Um, it, it is possible to build a brand around that so that people think of you when they think of whatever it is you do. Um, so I mean, it is possible to do that, um, but not with every site. 
That's I mean, well, I see Alan Bleiweiss is also weighed into that. Um, he tends to have some good thoughts and ideas. What's uh, what's he actually said about it? Oh, he was talking about um, um, oh, on. Tim's public up. relations. PR. Yeah, Tim Tim Kappa probably has some input on this. Uh, uh, I'm thinking yeah. of chocolates, for I well, would say. Yeah. So look, the thing is, you you, you need to figure out where you are in the market and what are you know who you are and what can you offer um, essentially a link you're going to get a link if you provide something that is is uh, unique that provides something whether that be funny whether it be interesting whether it be informative whether it be a guide it's something that people find of value that they want to link to reference or even just to say you know you have a look at this this is the greatest video i've ever seen you know um and you 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 need to really sit down and figure out who you are and what what, what you can do and i mean it can be done i mean you know boring of things uh we had a client with who, who manufactures wheelie bins how do you make something that's of interesting for a wheelie bin well, we came up with the wheelie, annual wheelie bin races. It was freaking hilarious. Races in a wheelie bin, it was filmed. Um, you know, we started getting companies and clients involved to come and race a wheelie bins. You know, eventually, it, you know, it snowballed. You know, then we started filling the wheelie bin with water. And what could you do with a wheelie bin? And, you know, Does wheelie that? bin boat, you know. So, although we provided on the site all the technical manufacturing process, the blow molding machines, everything you can possibly think of in terms of a technical aspect. It wasn't interesting, you know, unless you're, you know, the blow molding kind of guy that really wants to read the tech specs, which yes, people do, but how do we differentiate ourselves over and above the other 50 to 60 manufacturers in the country and well as the other 10,000 out there that can export it even cheaper from, from China, for example. So we needed to create something that resonated with people, that resonated with the fact that it's not just a blow molding company that's gonna churn out the stuff. So essentially we've got all the facts and details. That's, that's crucial. You need to have that in place. You need to have your tech specs, you need to, you know, have your ordering forms in, you need to have your sizes, everything needs to be found, easy identifiable on the site first. Then you can then start, you know, working on, on the brand and differenti differentiating yourself in the marketplace. So yes, you know, even wheelie bins, you can, once you understand your business and what, and, and where you want to put it in the market, that's when you can get, get a little bit creative. Um, you know, it, it all depends who you are and what you are. I mean, even an accountant, I mean, you could, uh, argument sake, look, there's not much great stuff accountants can really do. It's not sexy. It's not intriguing. And you can't, well, although I'd like to see a, a, an accountant in a wheelie bin, um, that's not really kind of relevant, <laughs> but uh, I mean, Business needs to be reminded of when their tax returns is coming up. Create an app. Uh, all the clients can download the app, whatever the case may be. You input your last date, you input whatever your, you know, I don't know, create an app that will be of use to people. It reminds you when it's, where, where it is, who's doing the tax return, where your registered office is. I don't know, create, do you see what I mean? You've got to think of something that kind of use and then mention you because you've created something that is of use or funny it doesn't have to necessarily yeah, no. be a piece of content yeah no if you can if you can make them laugh or make them um or give them something they really really need and i mean i i i was one of the first way way back when way back in the 90s that actually was putting out leaflet campaigns where only about 25% of the leaflet was devoted to selling something and the rest was stuff that they would put behind a fridge magnet, event calendars, God knows what. Um, <clears throat> and I had far, far, far more success 
with putting out stuff that they would find handy than I ever did with making the advertising banner as huge as humanly possible. So, I mean, actually, I think the wheelie bin races are <laughs> classic. It's a classic example. It's a classic. It's the kind of thing I would do actually if I had a wheelie bin client. Ah, <clears throat> uh, yeah, good. Okay, uh, well, Ryan Van Brunshot, that's your lot. Um, I think um, you'll be satisfied with that. Uh, let me tweak that and we'll go to the next. This one for Monika Sahar. And obviously, Monika is a very perceptive person because straight off the bat, she says, hello, experts. <laughs> um, she said, um, I am running a Google AdWords campaign for a website. Um, my clients reported that they got irrelevant calls or applications. Uh, and uh, I noticed so many irrelevant search terms. While I have added them as negative keywords, still those keywords are showing um, in search terms. Can you tell me how to avoid this irrelevant search and get more accurate search and conversion? Oh no, the, the person I thought would answer this has disappeared off the screen. Yes. Hold on a go there, okay. Oh, oh, sorry, was, was Sash? Nope, 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 no. I was, I was wanting... I was just going to ask the very obvious question to me, which is why doesn't she just pull the search terms that are pulling in the, uh, the irrelevant calls? Well, then you've got... What, remove, remove the keywords altogether? Yes, pause them and see what happens. Well, I'm also wondering if the negative keywords, she keeps saying they're coming back and, and uh, bidding is still happening. I'm wondering how broad that, that keyword theme is. And then also, mm. she's actually taking the proper steps of adding the ne negatives that would be causing the irrelevant calls or clicks and looking at that as suggested keywords. So just in your in your AdWords campaign in the, in the ad group itself, you just look over to you know, your negative tag and then to your keyword tag, your negative tag, and then suggested. And those are gonna be able to tell you exactly what that call or click used to actually, what query. And then you can go back towards your Google Analytics and look at the cam or keywords information in the analytics to then cross verify to see are those actually irrelevant? So I go back and forth to get my negative keywords and then fine tune that list all the way down to, you know, then I'm getting relevant phone calls and relevant ads. That's just a theory, just a concept, a thing I do. Yeah, yeah it, it does, picking up on something you said there, William, it does tend to suggest that these, uh, these keywords are, uh, have got uh, broad matches um, rather than, uh, Rather than the exact matches, so um, there's there's liable to be some uh, some bleeding around, even though yep. e even though Google uh, has messed up the exact matches by by making them slightly inexact. Um, yes, broad is not a bad thing. Broad's not a bad thing to use in general, but that it opens up for a whole different can of worms, and you have to be prepared to then go filter each day or each week. So you're not overbidding on something that you're not even, you know, wanting to actually click on anyways. Because that's just wasting your budget. Yeah. It's, yes, I, I, I agree with what you say. I think the, th the thing is that the, the question is about irrelevant calls or applications. And it, it's a case of um, that, that, that suggests to me that, that, um, that despite uh, Manika's um, efforts to, to stop uh, these uh, uh, these matches with with uh, irrelevant content, I irrelevant um, uh, searches, that it's still happening, isn't it? So, um, as I say, my my thought was to was to kill the uh, uh, kill the key phrases that they're bidding on. Um, um, maybe the other answer is to actually make them exact matches rather than broad ones. Uh, because there's obviously some sort of confusion here about how the uh, irrelevant 
parts of these key phrases are, uh, or searches are, are matching or not matching with the negative ones, if that makes sense. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, if so, so firstly, you, you, you really need to sort out, you know, your negative keywords. Um, probably, I don't know if you've got all in, you know, if you're using all in search query, you know, search queries, keywords, you know, with a plus, uh, you know, plus particular term, plus particular term. Sometimes that is going to catch all and really create uh, havoc um, unless you've got your negative keywords down pat. Um, so like David said, either go into phrase or exact, uh, exact. Um, you want to stay away from broad as, as much as possible. The other thing that, 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 that worries me a little bit is that even though they've come through to you, they've clicked through to the ad, they've gone through to the actual page, and then they've actually still called you or used the contact us, um, probably indicates to me that once they've even come through, still not seeing how that page or product or whatever actually not. Um, are they still then, you know, they must still then be confused about <coughs> what you're actually offering. So although you've probably got some kind of search query that may or may not lead to a bit of confusion, and that happens all the time, um, the, the, the more worrying bit is that they've actually then even phoned you from your site. And so then I would go back to your site and say, um, you know, do we need to clear up any ambiguity on our page or our site? Or um, so I would just look at those uh, those two side of things definitely. Just to, yeah, um, just, just to add to that a little bit, Tim. I think you know one of the things I'm also doing because I'm also doing a click to call ad right now or a campaign for for a client, and that's one thing that. I still need to learn how to actually look at in the reports itself. When you're looking at the ad extensions and you're looking at uh, you know, click extension or sorry call extension, it only gives you the numbers. It says okay, like 15 calls or clicks, right? My cost and what I spent, but it doesn't break it down to what keyword is actually triggering that click to call from cell phone because they're bypassing the website altogether. They're just clicking based off what they saw from mobile. And that might be also where the, the uh, discovery needs to be with the actual click to call. How did they, what triggered that? And I think that might be in the advanced reports. I haven't gotten that far yet. Cool. Well, I'm going to call that a, an answer for Monique Saha. And uh, thank her for a question. This one from Evgeny Olov. Um, it's titled How to Filter Search Console for Multiple Values at Once. Um, in other words, multiple keywords, multiple URLs. And oh, what's he done here? This um, looks to me, it's just like a. Um, nah, he's oh, link dropped. <laughs> he's just dropped the link and Dan's uh, picked it up. Okay. All right. Remove report and ban, uh, Evgeny. Anyway, well, that's our last one, I think. Uh, let me see. Yes, it is. It's thank you for watching time. Um, we thank you for your interest in um, uh, what we do uh, because um, your participation makes what we do worthwhile. And we'll be back at the same time next week uh, to do this all again.